and uh, welcome. Glad everybody's here. And this is the uh, every other Monday multifamily mastermind group. Normally we have about eight to 12 people on. It seems a little bit light tonight, but I think, I think what I found is that this last few days, uh, people are gone on vacation and things like that. It seems like other things that I've been doing has been a little bit empty. So the fourth, I think people are trying to get out and run around a little bit. So usually when I start, I, I kind of talk about something in the beginning. And tonight I want to, uh, I'm going to give a little PowerPoint. So let me get this set up here. Um, Bear with me a minute. I'm trying to share my screen here. You know where all the controls went. Okay. So what I want to, uh, what I will talk about here this evening is um, hang on guys, I can't find my notes now. This is crazy, I apologize. Bear with me one second, I apologize. All right, here we go. All right, can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, we can. I can see your screen. All right, good. So what I want to talk about tonight is the Jahari window, uh, which was first developed in the 1950s by two psychologists as a tool to help individuals better understand themselves and their relationship with others. And I think this goes to uh, real estate, real estate investing. It's it really some clear definitions and things that we'll look at here tonight. But it's defined specifically as four quadrants. It's what we know, what we don't know, the unknowns, and the things that we think we know that we don't know. It kind of becomes a little bit uh, confusing. But if we look at the four quadrants, we see in the top left-hand corner, it says, I know what I know. So, you know, everybody has that level of competency, right? They, we all know what we know. So when we're out looking at real estate or we're looking at multifamily, we know, you know, two units, four units, we know how to do some evaluation. But what about um, what we don't know? So then we have to start to look at, um, if we look at the top right, it says, don't know what I, what I know. So, you know, there are things that we have to pay attention to, like, rents and how we collect rents and how we can raise rents and repairs and things like that that we can do on those units uh, from from an operational standpoint management standpoint and we know that there's things that we need to learn and things that we need to know um, uh, completely in order to operate and then if we look in the bottom left hand corner it says uh, know what i don't know so again, I, I know that there's other things that I don't know. 
And the bottom right is, I don't know what I don't know. And there's clearly a lot of things that we will come up in our investing career uh, that we don't know at all and that we have to learn. But it's good that when we go into multifamily investing or real estate investing or property management, that we are clear on the fact that there are some things that we don't know that we need to go and learn. So, you know, the top quadrants really show that these are things that we definitely know, that we know what we need to know. We know that uh, there's more that we need to learn. And that the bottom two quadrants really are that we don't know. We, you know, there's clearly things that we don't know. So what I ask you is, you know, where do you find yourself in your own real estate investing? You know, how are you affected by any one of these quadrants? Maybe you know a lot. Maybe you're really educated about real estate, about operations, about how to buy a property, how to exit a property, and everything that goes on in between. But maybe there's some things you're real good at, and others that you're not, that you know you need to learn. So what are you planning for yourself? How are you taking a look at your investing career, your portfolio? How are you gonna build in that? And what are you gonna do to, uh, to learn what you need to learn? You know, it's really dependent upon which area of your life uh, that you wanna work in too. You, are, are, do we need to sharpen things in our personal life and our uh, in our business life, and where do we need to grow more? So I, I want you, as we talk tonight, to really, uh, you know, think about your own business and think about the, the things that you're trying to accomplish in your uh, real estate career and how you can grow more and what you need for your own business to grow things in your own business to help your business um, go to the next level. And what is that for you? So I would hope that you are real clear on your why and your intention on your goal, as far as uh, having a plan and a strategic outcome, what you're looking for. You know, one of the things that I like to teach people is um, eg about exit planning, right? I think as real estate investors, and I've spent, you know, over the years, hundreds of thousands of dollars on training and seminars and coaching to, to really learn how to buy a deal, find a deal, get into it, but not how to get out of it. And you know, there, there's that old cliche in real estate that says, uh, we make money when we buy real estate. The problem is that we might make money when we buy it, but we never realize it until the deal is over and until we're getting out of it. So is there enough planning up front for that exit of the real estate in order to, to grow a little bit more? So what I want to do now is just kind of open the floor up. We're going to go around about three different times. Um, I'd like uh, people to, you know, just participate. You can participate or not. You know, if you don't want to uh, jump in, you don't have to. First time we go around, um, just introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from, what you do, a little bit about your real estate investing, a uh, little bit about your goals. What are you trying to accomplish? And you know, what would you like to learn? Is being a participant on this call uh, or in this event, what, what would you like to learn? What would be rewarding for you and help you to feel like you really accomplished something? So Tony, why don't we start with you tonight? Um, you've been here a couple of times. Maybe you can kind of uh, you know, lead, the, lead the charge here this evening for us. <laughs> All right, Mike. Yeah, so I'm Tony from uh, the Detroit area, and my wife and I have some rental properties in the suburbs of Detroit for uh, going on 25 years now, starting in 1995. And we got into that because, uh, you know, once we had our first kid, she quit uh, as an engineer at General Motors, so we needed some way to supplement the income. So we've been doing that for 25 years now, and we're thinking through uh, the finances and the cross collateralization and stuff of our properties and perhaps looking at a multifamily in the springtime. So right now we're regrouping, sir, where we are on our rental properties and that type of stuff. And uh, what I hope to learn from you, Mike, with all your expertise in this area is to, to calm me down and my wife to give us the confidence to go forward. Because when we bought our first house, it took me three years. Huh. And then we, then we went gangbusters and bought, you know, quite a few, but uh, buying a, you know, an apartment building is a little more, uh, it's just, it's just not out of my comfort zone, you know, out of our comfort zone a little bit. So uh, we hope to learn from you how to do that and give us the confidence to do it going forward. Sure, sure. And it, you know, 
it's interesting. It, it always seems like there's a ramp up period for people. You know, it took you three years to buy your first one. And then all of a sudden you had 90 or something at one point, right? Right. You know, I did a podcast last week with a guy who is in the single family arena. Five years he's been doing fix and flips. And in, in the last 13 months, well, he's done 80 deals in five years. In the last 13 months, he's done 55 of those deals. So, you know, there's that ramp up period, right? And so as you start to make that, that switch into multifamily, you'll get there. And the one thing that's nice about multifamily, right, is it's economies of scale. So you could take those hundred units that you owned and they were all scattered all over the city, but now you put them in one location and it's a little, a lot easier to manage and a lot more cost effective, right? So, um, Sven, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Sven White. Um, I'm in Evanston. Um, I work in information technology. Um, and um, I, um, I, I'm not sure if this, if I'm the exact fit for this group. Um, my focus is a little more on, at this point um, a little humbler, I'm more focused on small multifamily, you know, uh, you know, uh, but um, in terms of um, where I am, you know, I, I have a duplex and I'm interested in expanding. Um, and um, I'm certainly interested in larger multifamily. It's just, um, I'm not sure if that's something that's um, very um, realistic in the shorter term, um, but I'm also on the lookout for opportunities to collaborate, and what have you. And, and obviously to learn. Sure. Well, you know what? I think that uh, we can always learn from each other, right? I, I, somebody asked me one time, they say, how come you like real estate so much? I said, I, I like it and I'm passionate about it because it never gets old. I can always learn something new. And I learn things from, you know, novice investors to seasoned investors. And, you know, somebody's always got a different way that something might work a little bit better. Here's the good news for you, and you might want to write this down, is uh, the 15th is a Wednesday evening. I will be doing a webinar on creating wealth with small multifamily uh, uh, properties. So um, you might want to jump on that and uh, learn a little bit from that. And anybody who wants, if you want to go to the chat and put your information in the chat, I'll make sure that you get an email for that webinar and my podcasts and that. Uh, Alexis, uh, would you like to go next? Sure. So I'm Alexis. I'm in Indianapolis. Um, I work in finance, specifically in mutual funds. Um, I have been interested in real estate, I'd say maybe a year, uh, or I'd say about two at this point. 2019 was just a lot of preparation, a lot of um, studying a lot of um, just preparing for it. And now in 2020, I'm ready to get started. But um, what I realize is it's a lot, the market in Indianapolis is tough for um, multifamily. So similar to spend, I'm interested in like a um, smaller multifamily property. So like maybe three or four units. Um, I have two real estate agents that have been on, on, really just trying to find a good unit, but it's like, as soon as they hit the market, they're gone. Um, been looking since maybe March and they, so that's, that's where I am. I've done tons and tons of research, tons of preparation, but it's really just finding the right one and pulling the trigger. So i um, interested in this group. I'm definitely going to check out the webinar on the 15th, just to, you know, take it all in and see what I can learn and, and hopefully share some also in the process. Perfect. Good. Glad you're here. You know, uh, so it sounds like Indianapolis is pretty hot, a pretty hot market right now, huh? It is. Yep, it is. Um, that's interesting. You know, I know that I've talked to some people in some other markets where it's not real hot, but you know, like Chicago, if you put something on the market and it, if it's worth anything, it's gone. So yep. Uh, Aaliyah, you would be up next. Hi everyone, my name is Aaliyah James. I live in Chicago. I'm an associate accountant at Northern Trust. I graduated from UIC last year, so I'm pretty new to real estate, but I'd love to learn about your experience with being a landlord and 
any advice you'll have for a house hacker? I plan on buying a multi-unit and living in one of the units. Perfect. Well, you're in the right place, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> um, so you, you do own a house and you're living in it now? No, I live with my parents. Oh, got you. Okay. All right. All right. Perfect. Well, like I said, you're in the right place. So a little background on myself. Um, I've been in real estate and construction. That's my background. Uh, I sold residential real estate in the Northwest suburbs of Chicago for a number of years. I, I built a team. We were selling about 125 homes a year. Uh, 2005, I noticed the market was starting to shift and that I would not be able to keep the production up uh, as, as that market changed on us. So I went into the private equity business, uh, apartment business. I, I raised about $18 million in private equity and bought $60 million in real estate. We owned 4,000 apartments in five different states. Had a real big portfolio in, um, in the Dallas market and then again in the uh, Ohio Valley. And, um, and today I uh, coach and train. I love what I do. I do a lot of, a little bit of property management and um, uh, you know, I really like giving back and teaching other people uh, success strategies and um, how to um, you know, move forward with their career. So um, I've done about $285 million worth of transactions um, over the course of 20 some years and um, some good, some bad. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, you learn a lot along the way, that's for sure. Not only about the business, but about people and about life. And uh, that's why I think real estate is, uh, is a platform that I really enjoy. So what I'd like to do this time around is I'd like to go around and talk about um, a stumbling block that you might be facing. You know, we talked about those four quadrants at the beginning. And one of the quadrants is I don't know what I don't know, right? Well, what do you think in your own mind right now that is holding you back or something that you don't know? It might even be a fear that you're trying to overcome. It could be um, just, you know, how do I go about financing? Or if I find a property, what do I look for? You know, throw a question out there. You know, I think that there's some people on the phone that have a little bit of experience that, that might be able to, to give a couple of answers to those types of things. Uh, why don't we change it up a little bit? Maybe uh, uh, Alexis, you go first. Sure. So just to kind of reiterate, I feel like my biggest stumbling block right now is just two things, catching a hold of a property. I'm, I'm kind of in a place of, um, I have the real estate agents that are doing their job, but I feel like maybe there's something more I should be doing. Like maybe I should be being more proactive. Maybe I should be on Zillow myself or on real estate, you know, different, you know, websites to try and find a property. Um, so that's just me partly feeling like I'm ready to go ahead and pull the trigger. Um, just need the, you know, I need the right one to come up. And I guess the second thing would be, um, what would your advice be? Because initially I was going to um, buy a turnkey and um, similar to, uh, Alea, similar to her, I was going to live in one property and rent the other three out. And initially I said, hey, I could just buy a turnkey. Um, I'll collect rent. I'll live in one. I'll call it a day. But then all through further research, I wondered, what, what would it be better to do a fixer upper and look at maybe like a FHA 203k and do some renovations and then I have some equity built in up front so I guess the, I know that was two questions but that's that's where I am yeah so do you think that you could find a uh, turnkey that that you could have some equity built in when you bought when you made the acquisition that would be yeah. one question that I would ask. So, so if you found a, uh, you know, let's just use a hundred thousand dollar purchase price, right? Just for easy math, and you were able to get a, a ten or a twelve percent discount off of that from the seller, and then maybe get the seller to, you know, um, put some, you know, pay some points if you went FHA or, you know, a, a run a scenario like that. You, you're kind of building in some equity, you know, if you okay. If, at that point. When you look at uh, doing a rehab or doing a value add, 
first of all, you have to ask yourself, do I have the time? Do I have the experience? Uh, do I have the knowledge? Now, all those things you can conquer if you don't have them, right? So you build a team, you put people in your, in your corner to work with you, to help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. I'm really big on, on writing out your goals and being real clear on what you want and, and real clear on, on your why, you know, hey, I want $100,000, but, but why do I want it, right? Right. Um, so, you know, I want this two flat. You said something interesting, you know, buy, buy a, a multi-unit and live in one. I think, and um, one, of the, one of the greatest things a, a beginning investor can do today is find a two or a three unit building, even a four unit, anything up to a five unit is residential, right? Go get an FHA mortgage, 203B is a, it's a 203B or is it a K? Um, Tony, which one is the commercial one, the B or the K? Do you remember we we had this conversation? Yeah, the that, commercial the commercial one's gone now. They only have the residential now. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah. All right. So so that two hundred three loan, you know, is a great loan to get and to uh, do your rehab with, right? But here's what I like: you can buy a, a, a three unit building. You can live in one of the units, get an FHA mortgage, put three or four three or four percent down on that property you've got other people that are helping you pay your mortgage gives you the ability to save more money and in 12 or 18 months you can move on to another property and then rent the other unit and if you do the math and and on my webinar i actually lay this out and i show the math how this works if you do the math you're actually uh, when when you move out and somebody's living there, you're actually now in a positive cash flow position, which helps you continue to grow that portfolio from that standpoint. So, you know, I don't know that I'm answering your question. I think it it, it boils down to your own ability and knowledge of what you you know believe that you can accomplish on your own. If you can do a value add, do a value add. The more money you can build into that equity, the better off you're going to be. Awesome. Yes, you answered it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sven, how about you? Uh, well, I guess there are a lot of um, a lot of challenges on my end, just in terms of um, you know timing and what have you. But I guess the um, the most I think the thing that maybe you guys might be able to um, help me with most practically is if you have any ideas on um, how to go about as a non-construction, you know, professional, um, how to, inf you know, become more educated on estimating costs for rehab and identifying, you know, you know, basically the, the, the various, you know, um, you know, numbers you're going to plug into your spreadsheet when you're trying to figure out whether something is a potential deal. Cause you know, um, that's the, um, for someone who doesn't have that background, um, you know, obviously it's very easy to lose your shirt. And so I'm not sure how you go about getting edu getting more educated in those sorts of estimates. Yeah. Um, I, I, I understand um, what you're saying. So uh, how do you get educate yourself? So a couple of things that I would do is I, first of all, I'd go spend some time at Home Depot and at Lowe's. And I would just take a look at, at costs of material, you know, mm -hmm. take a look at what appliances cost. Take a look at what kitchen cabinets cost. Take a look mm -hmm. at what paint costs. Give yourself an idea of material costs, right? And which is, which is always a changing um, platform. Then the next thing I would do is talk to some people who have had some rehab work done. Mm -hmm. Talk to somebody who put a bath in. You know, I mean, I've put bathrooms in that I've spent 3,500 and I've spent 7,000 and I've spent 12,000. So what, you know, what kind of finishes, what kind of products, you know, you can buy a toilet for $79 or you can spend $700 on a toilet. So, you know, there's different uh, areas you can spend your time, right? Um, what I would do is build work on building my network. So 
I would start to talk to contractors and I would start to befriend uh, different, maybe different trades. You know, I, I could tell you that if I was putting a new electric service in a single family house today in the city of Chicago, that I would spend uh, about $2,500, $2,700 for an electrician to come out and do that. I could tell you that if you were putting a new furnace in, uh, in into a property today with a hot water heater and a furnace and an air conditioner, that you're probably going to spend somewhere around $3,500 to $4,500 for all of that, depending on how big of an air conditioner, how big of a furnace, right? So you kind of can start to get a feel for that. Um, there's websites you can go to that'll give you some pricing. I, I don't know any right offhand, but you could you could do some things that would give you some pricing and give you an idea of what might be out there, right? So um, it, it becomes about research, right? Mm -hmm. And you, this goes back to the thing that I was saying about education earlier. If you can educate yourself and, and learn, and you learn from other people, you learn from people's successes as well as their failures, you know? So um, it's, uh, it, it's how we learn. And, and unfortunately, you get in there and you do it and you, know, you think it's gonna take two weeks and it winds up taking three. And you thought it was $1,000, but it, now it was 1,200. Um, and there are the times you thought it was 1,000 and it was 900 and you thought it would take two weeks, but it took 10 days. So, you know, can't go both ways. You just, you know, you learn as you go along, so. Sure. Um, That's a good idea about the um, paying attention to the prices at the hardware stores. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Leah, how about yourself? Yeah, I have a ton of questions, but okay. um, yeah, just a few, I guess. Because I've been reading Bigger Pockets and I see a lot of investors talking about creating an LLC and saying that you're the property manager instead of the owner. Like, I would just like your opinion for me becoming a house hacker in 2021. Um, my opinion on that? Yeah, uh, creating an LLC for starting out. What do you think? Um, and, and this is going to be the home that you live in? Yes. Yeah, you know, um, on the home you live in, I, I, my personal belief is, and, and listen, I'm not an attorney and I'm not an accountant. I only know what I know um, from personal experience. For personal residents, I, I really wouldn't do it in an LLC. It doesn't serve any purpose for you. Um, but if it was an investment property, uh, I would definitely do an LLC. I don't think you need to, to spend the extra money right now for that, unless that first property was going to be one that you were going to buy and, and be an investor, you know, that was an investment property for you. I believe that you, if you're living in a property and, and in, a, in a year from now, you're going to go buy another property and keep that one as an investment, then I would create an LLC and put that property, deed that property into the LLC. Mm -hmm. So that's just my thoughts about it. Um, Tony, do you have any suggestions on that or? Yeah, Mike, you know, we, we've done it both ways. When we first started, our asset protection attorney told us that we should have every house in its own LLC, single member LLC, and then the, the single member of the LLC is owned by a trust. And then back and forth and back and forth between my wife and I. Well, what happened real quick after 20 or 30 or 40 of these houses, we couldn't keep the paperwork up and it was, it was cost prohibitive. So as I talked to my insurance agent one day, she said, Tony, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm scared to death of being sued. That's the only reason really to do it is, to, is for asset protection. You know, someone slip and falls and they take everything you have. And so what we did at State Farm is we have a, a blanket liability policy. It's a $2 million policy for, I don't know, $1,500 or 2000 bucks a year. And it covers us on everything. So what we do now is we have our, our properties held pretty much individually with my wife and I, but we have a management LLC. So when you so when a tenant writes a check, it goes into the LLC, all the mortgages are paid from the LLC, and any 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 profits get dispersed to us as the as the as the single members. My wife is a single member, but but my point to this was when I looked into this, there were two reasons, you know, asset protection and taxes. 
And so the taxes part, because they're single member LLCs, it flows down to you personally anyway, so it, so it doesn't matter. It was the asset protection. And once we had State Farm covers, and I've been sued maybe a dozen times, and we had nowhere near the, even the liability policy limit. So it's just something to consider because the lawyers will always tell you single LLC for every single property. But again, it's just, you really need to sit back and say, okay, well, why do I need to do it? And like you said, Mike, I'm not an attorney or an accountant either. But after 25 years, we sort of been through, been sued many, many times, and every single time, State Farm has jumped in, and and we were good to go. Yeah. Does that help, Aaliyah? Oh, definitely. Thank you, Mike and Tony. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think that uh, a lot of times experience becomes the best teacher, you know, and obviously Tony's had some um, experience around that, so. Anybody else have uh, have any other uh, issues? Tony, did you have anything that you wanted to throw out tonight that you're thinking about, or uh, 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 you know maybe need some advice on? Well, Mike, I think the the one thing that my wife and I are struggling with I, on the single family homes, uh, we pretty much bought for cash, refinanced, pulled the equity out, and, and paid ourselves back and rented them out for 25 years, and refinanced the same properties many, many times. So the, the houses are pretty liquid. What we're, we're concerned about on the multifamily, and this is where I need your help on, is this perception of 25% down. Mm. And then apartments or multifamilies are relatively illiquid. So if we had to refinance, it's not as liquid as a single family home, but there's certainly so many benefits of the multifamily. That's why we're leaning towards trying to get into that. But we're just nervous of having this 25% tied up. So, you know, it's the down payment. And that's really what we could use your help on going forward is how do we reduce that uh, down payment going forward? Okay. So, you know, I think too, and we've had this conversation, Tony, about leverage, right? Um, don't be over leveraged. You know, I bought a lot of real estate at 15% down, which looking back at it, what, what probably wasn't the smartest thing to do, uh, having a 85% loan to value. Um, on those large properties, right? It, you know, when you're buying a two unit or a four unit that you're going to live in, if you can put three or five percent down, you're okay because you're living there, right? And it, it's a different animal. But in going into the multifamily arena, like like you're talking about, you know, you're probably going to sell most of your portfolio off, take the capital, and go and you know buy a hundred units. Um, here, here's the thing, you can drive value in the multifamily situation. So if you buy a property that is undervalued uh, or at value, but you can increase the value. So you have to take a look at things like, what can I do to uh, increase rents? And, and I don't care if you're buying a four flat, a two flat, a 200 unit apartment complex. How do I increase rents? Is it um, I can do some rehabs, I can raise rents, I can change management, I can add an amenity that wasn't there before. So an example might be, I buy a property that uh, all the units are, are uh, on average $100 a month below market rents. I can go in and start to raise those rents. And over the course of 12 to uh, 18 months, I've raised a hundred units rent, you know, maybe not a hundred dollars, but $50 a month. And that really starts to increase value. So now I can go back to the bank a year later and say, hey, look, I've increased value. I've brought it up to X and X equals Y today. And Y being the new value of the property, because remember apartments are valued on NOI. NOI is net operating income. So you take all the income that comes in, you pay the expenses, what's left over is called NOI. That's before your debt service. So there's a valuation that the bank or the lender gives to that NOI that creates additional value. So if you can go in, let's say that you bought a property and you know it hadn't been remodeled in a while and you go in and you put 2,500 or $5,000 in each unit and you raise those rents and you increase the cash flow, you increase the value, you put new tenants in, new tenants, you always can charge a little bit more. You change the curb appeal. 
So if it takes you 24 months or 30 months to get to that point, to walk back into your bank and say, we've increased the value, uh, we would like to refinance and pull my capital out. So, you know, no, it's not instantaneous, but real estate, you know, inherently is not liquid, right? It's going to take you a period of time to, to create a liquid event with real estate. So you have to give it time to be able to do that and um, to be able to go back and do that refinance. You know, unfortunately, there's no magic answer, right? But, um, but you'll get there over time. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to say was amenities, Tony. Uh, I know I've kind of shared this with you in the past, but we, you know, in the past, I've done things like I've gone in and built some storage, uh, a storage building and made, you know, five by five storage lockers, which has given value, which you can rent. We've put garages in, which you can rent. We've done things like uh, I put a car washing uh, station in where, you know, and these are bigger complexes too, but we put a car washing station in and, you know, now it's coin operated or a couple of vending machines. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do to increase value and the perception of value that you increase for a tenant uh, causes tenant retention. And when you cause tenant retention where the tenants stay longer, you can raise those rents greater, so. All right, thanks, Mike. I'll be, I'll be trying to uh, siphon some stuff out of your brain the next six, eight months or so to, to give us the confidence to go forward on one of these things. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I just want to open it up again. If somebody has some uh, other questions or, or thoughts that they want to throw out, um, we have a few minutes left. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so if you're not at a point yet where you can pull the trigger, you know you're not gonna be able to pull the trigger for, I don't know, six months or maybe longer. Uh, at what point, um, how far in advance is it like um, unprofessional or just a, you think a waste of your time to be like working with, um, you know, realtors and what have you? You know, I mean, obviously you don't want to be running people ragged when you know you're not gonna be ready for a while, but at the same time you wanna research the market and mm -hmm. get a sense what's out there, what's likely to be out there when you are ready. So let me ask you this, when do you think you're gonna be ready? I would guess probably maybe the new year. Okay, so uh, do you think that the market today will be the same in January as it is today? No, certainly not, um, presumably not. Um, you know, which direction, I don't, I don't know. Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of speculation right now around that, because mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody really knows, you know, I, I have a couple of friends that are economists, and, and they say different things. And, you know, if you listen to the news, you hear other things. Uh, speculation can always get a get an investor in trouble, right? I think that what we're going to see, though, I just I posted an article this morning, you might have seen it on, uh, on the meetup group that just talked about uh, how rents are, are going to start to crash as a result of COVID, right? So if rents start to crash, what we're going to find will be that um, property values will come down. So Sven, what you might look at today at $100,000 come January, because of what could transpire in the next six months might be worth 85,000 come January. So the, the market could change. Now, it, it, the education is good to learn about the market and to watch trends between now and then. You could probably do that on Zillow. You could probably do that on Hubzoo uh, yourself, you know, just kind of keeping track of that. Listen, I have no dog in the race right now. So um, I, I, you know, if you go to a real estate agent, you're probably not going to get good information like you'd like you'd like to get. You know, if you told a real realtor right now, well, I want to um, buy a property, but I'm not going to buy it till January. They're not going to pay attention to you right now. Sure. They're going to tell you to come back in November. Yeah. Um, if you go to a real estate agent and say, well, if something came up and I was going to buy it right now, but you know, in the back of your mind, you're not going to buy it. <laughs> you kind of waste your time uh, on, on every 
you know, with them, with yourself. Yeah. I would spend more time online uh, researching the pricing of, you know, rehabs, contractors, those types of things, and spend time on Zillow. And, um, you know, I know there's a couple other, I can't think of them right off the top of my head, that you could watch trends and see how fast properties sell, see what they sell for, see what's on the market. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, hopefully that helps. Yeah, I'm not discouraging you, but because I think you need to get educated. But I really believe we're going to see a market shift here in the next, uh, you know, 90 days. So, yeah, I believe it. Oh, Alexis, one thing that I was thinking about, um, mm -hmm. I, I know you're in Indy and um, in the market being hot. Have you thought about looking for any off market properties for yourself? So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a couple off property, or I'm sorry, off market properties have come up uh, that me and one of the real estate agents have taken a look at. I am kind of what we've run into before, and I guess this is just part of the learning curve, is how quickly they go. So like there was one that came up, it was a turnkey, incredible, incredible property, fourplex renovated, but it was around 259, which was a little higher than what I wanted to pay. Um, and within like two days, it was gone. So I think he... I, I think I should reach out and I, maybe I should be more proactive with him. He knows I'm ready. He sends stuff as it comes up, but he, I think because these properties are a bit tougher and they go so quick, I kind of have to stay on him about like, you know, about my search and, and, and being proactive. So. Sure. So um, can I give you a couple of, of little tips maybe? I'd love that. Yep. So do you know what area you want to be in? or are you kind of looking in a couple different areas? Yep, so I, I know the area that I'd like to be in, but in Indy, there's two locations that these always come up in. One is uh, near Irvington. It's kind of like the east side of Indianapolis. Another is Fountain Square, which is just south of downtown. It's kind of an up and coming area. I'm pretty open. I'd, I'd like to stay closer to the west end of Indy, but I, I'm open as long as the neighborhood's okay and the property on the inside looks pretty good. I, I'm, I'm open. It's okay if I have to downgrade on the area. Okay, so here's a couple of things. So if you go to your local uh, assessor's office, you could get a list. Um, sometimes you can go directly to the city. Sometimes you have to go to the county assessor's office sometimes you have to go to the um, uh, local city office or city assessor, right? So there's, there's three different places you could go. You, they'll probably have you fill out a Freedom of Information uh, Act, but you ask them, can you give me all the owners of, multi, of small multi-unit properties in Indy, in this neighborhood, in this subdivision, and they will print you an Excel spreadsheet of all those owners, properties, and where the tax bill gets sent. Now, what you could do is you could contact those owners yourself. And you could awesome. say, uh, you know, my name is uh, Alexis, and I am a real estate investor, or I'm looking to buy a uh, a multi, a small multi-unit for myself. I would like to uh, see if you're thinking about selling your property and you start writing letters and, you know, you'd be surprised. You write a few letters, somebody gets the, uh, and I mean a few letters to the same owner. So I okay. might start a letter campaign of eight or nine letters over the course of six months that are all handwritten and that I'd send to these owners. And what, what you'll find happens is these owners throw these letters in the drawer and they sit in the drawer and all of a sudden one day they go, wow, where's that letter? I'm gonna sell this thing. Here's your best owners. The ones who own property in Indy but they live in Florida right now. Mm. And 
you know, or somewhere out of town. And, and you can see that on the taxes where that tax bill is being sent somewhere else. The other thing you could do is ask your realtor that you're working with, hey, can you pull me the tax records for any unowner, owner, unowner, unoccupied property? So owner, for the owners that don't live in the property, right? The tax bill is okay. being sent somewhere else. Okay. And your your bro, you know your broker is probably not going to do that work, but he'll pull you the list. Now, if you have the tax list, you start writing letters, and you'd be surprised what'll come up. You know, and if you're going to be an investor and you start this little campaign, you might all of a sudden come up with three or four different properties. And and here's what I know is that when properties come up, if they're good, you'll always find money to be able to do a deal or you'll find an investor, or you'll find a partner or somebody to help you. So, um, awesome. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else, Aaliyah? Yeah, that was very helpful. I didn't know that I could go to the, um, well, in Cook County, the assessor's office or city hall. Yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about Cook County for a minute, okay? Cook County and Chicago Cook County are two different, uh, two different entities, really. Um, they're not, but they are. They, um, Chicago Cook County is a lot tougher than Cook County as a whole. Um, and the Cook County is a lot different than the other collar counties like Lake County and DuPage County and Kane County and those. So, um, I went to the Kane County Assessor's Office and I said, I was looking for multifamily properties in a um, specific area in Elgin. And that specific area, they told me I needed to go to the um, local Elgin uh, Assessor's Office. So depending on where you're at in Cook County, you may have the same thing where you have to go to the lo at the local level, right? So if you're, let's just say you're in. Um, in yeah, South let's say I'm looking at Oak Lawn or Evergreen Park. Perfect. So you probably want to start at the local level. I would call the Oak Lawn Tax Assessor, which um, is going to be different than Cook County, right? Because it's going to be the village of Oak Lawn and you're going to um, ask the tax assessor. And what you'll find is if they don't have the information, they'll tell you who does have the information. So once you figure out who's got the information, you can go to them and get what you want and then start this uh, letter campaign for yourself. Wonderful, thank you, Mike. Yeah, you bet. All right. Um, anybody? Anybody else? Any last questions or thoughts? I have everybody's email. I will make sure that you guys all get on the list for the webinar coming up on the fifteenth. Like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, creating uh, creating wealth with small multifamily properties. So um, it's kind of interesting how that came up tonight. You know. So. Uh, anybody needs anything my information is in the contact there feel free to reach out to me if I can answer any questions or you know be of help to anybody um, and you know like I said this meetings every other week um, on the other Mondays I do a property management meeting we talk about operations and and uh, relevant issues with today you know collecting rents and how we do due diligence and you know get repairs done and you know, get into uh, show properties to tenants and things like that. That's always some good conversation as well if you uh, guys have an interest in that at all. So, but I appreciate everybody being here tonight. I hope everybody got something and was helpful and look forward to seeing everybody come back again. Yeah, Thanks. for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good evening, everybody. You too. You as well. You too.